right, good evening, everyone. I'd like to welcome everyone to tonight's fourth and final session of the story of startups. We're gonna be talking about raising capital tonight and we have two special guests. My name is Kayla Del Biondo. I'm coordinator of programming and outreach for adults at New Canaan Library. And it's been my pleasure working with Laura Budd, executive director of New Canaan Chamber of Commerce to organize this series that's been going on all month long. Before we go ahead and get started, I just wanted to share with everyone a few Zoom housekeeping tips. Um, if you're new here, we have been using the live transcript feature for accessibility reasons. If for some reason you find that distracting, you don't need it and you'd like it turned off, you can click on uh, what you'll see on your screen. It should be called live transcript or closed captioning and you can go ahead and hide those subtitles. Um, one other thing, we're gonna be taking a few questions after our two special guests uh, present tonight and speak with Christine tonight. We ask that you use the Q&A feature of Zoom rather than the chat, just so that we can see your questions uh, loud and clear. I'll turn it over to Laura now. Hi, good evening, everyone. Thank you. I can't believe the four weeks has gone this quickly. Uh, we've really had a great session. We're very pleased with how the story of startups uh, ha has gone. Uh, we're looking forward to, of course, hearing from Christine Sullivan again. Uh, and we've got Michael Pita from Bankwell, who's agreed to... Uh, sit in and share some information about what banks look for uh, when raising capital, as well as Jessica Dodge, who's the Director of Operation and Programs at CT Next. Uh, and then at the end, we're looking forward, we've got uh, two volunteers for elevator pitches, and we think that's going to be a great interactive way. So thank you very much, and thank you for our guests for being here, and I'll uh, hand it over to Christine. Thank you, Laura. Thank you, Kayla. I can't believe we're at our fourth week. And thank you to everyone who's tuned in week after week. I am really excited about this topic. Um, it's near and dear to my heart and really excited about our special guests. I'm going to share my screen. Just takes a minute. Can everybody see that? So we're going to talk about raising capital 101 and uh, I'm a former investment banker. So this is what I did for quite a long time during my career. So we're going to do just a quick snapshot of the different capital options that you have debt versus equity. Um, some of the ins and outs of each and what you need to approach either a loan, uh, a loan officer to bank or somebody to invest equity with you. Then, as Laura said, we'll introduce Michael Pita at Bankwell to talk to you about what it takes to be a good candidate for loan. And Jessica Dodge will share some of the great things, ways that Connecticut supports our entrepreneurs in the process of raising equity. So first of all, to start with, um, debt is borrowing money from a lender that you pay back with interest over time. Very simple. Many people have mortgages. So that's probably the most um, accessible option uh, when you think about a loan. Equity, though, is when you trade ownership of your business in return for capital. And there are pros and cons of each. So if you think about taking a loan, it doesn't affect the ownership of your business. So you retain control the whole time. It can be flexible with a range of repayment options. You think about there are five-year loans, two-year loans, 30-year loans. The cons that you do have to pay interest and you do have to repay the, the original principal. And that if you default on your business loan, you could lose your business entirely. So when you think about equity, there are no interest payments. And if your business fails, no repayment would likely occur. Um, but the cons are the process of raising equity is very challenging. Um, you do have partners. So when I work with clients who are looking to raise equity, I tell them it's a lot like getting married. You need to be able to make decisions in good times and bad. And over time, if you disagree with your investors on the direction of the company, you could be forced out. The decisions on whether your business is a good candidate for debt or equity, some oftentimes come down to the type of business it is. Some things are just more likely to be um, the kind of business that creates cash flow and would enable, enable you to repay debt versus equity. But some of the questions that we would work through are, you know, how soon do you need the financing? How much capital do you need? Um, businesses and individuals and entrepreneurs have different capacities for, uh, for raising funds. Are you looking for money or money plus advice or guidance or mentorship? Because a lot of those things come along with um, with one or the other. 
How do you feel about sharing your business or growing your team? And what kind of vision do you have for how much growth you're looking for? So in terms of getting a loan, and this is something I'm just gonna highlight some basics and then we're gonna let Michael talk a little later, but the deliverables that you need to go to a bank to be a credible applicant, you need you know, something in the three to five to 10 year projections of what your business is gonna do, profit and loss statement, cash flow statement. You need a business plan and it can be short, but it needs to be thorough and thoughtful. And you also have to likely have good uh, personal credit, especially if it is your first loan. There are a variety of different loan alternatives. You can go to a traditional bank. There are SBA, Small Business Administration loans. Um, some of those loans um, during the current market um, are very compelling from an interest rate perspective. But again, I'm going to let Michael talk about that. Raising equity is a little bit of a different, uh, different beast. Um, people always talk about the deck and what that has to look like. And we spend a lot of time um, at the Small Business Development Center working on people's investor decks. What should be in my slide deck? Now, this is a question we get all the time. So I thought I would just share some information here. And um, again, Jessica is gonna be able to comment on some of these things as well. But there's a lot of um, templates that you can find on the internet. There are you know, everybody's favorite slide decks that people copy and make their own. But the topics on the left, they're a little more nuanced and slightly different than what you'd look at compiling if you were looking at a loan. Um, the types of things that you wanna talk about is your problem statement. You wanna be able to highlight the problem that your solution is solving. Um, you know, all investors want to understand your business and your business model. They want to understand the market, the market size out there. How big an addressable market can this solution represent? Um, it's always good to talk a little bit about the underlying magic, as well as your competition and your competitive advantage in the market. Then highlighting your go-to-market plan and your team, and then, of course, some financials and use of proceeds. Um, Guy Kawasaki has some good resources on the internet. He's a, a pretty famous um, VC, but he says, I've never seen a presentation that has too few slides, too big a font or too little graphics. So it's definitely a question of less is more. So these are some resources and we can share these after in case this is something you're looking at. And for now, I'm gonna end my portion and stop sharing my slides and let Michael introduce himself and Bankwell. Thank you, Christina. Mike Peter here. I'm with Bankwell Bank in New Canaan. That's where we're headquartered. I've been with the bank since 2010. Um, and I'm in charge of the small business uh, development and our small business lending program. Uh, typically, small business is a loan, which is 2 million and under. Um, so sometimes not so small. But for the most part, it's, it's nascent businesses, it's new businesses. And Christine, can you put your slide up um, where it listed the different types of SBA financing? Are you able to do that while I talk? Sure. Okay. Um, because what Christine talked about and, and some of the, um, the gist of her conversation was more for starting a new business. And I wanna say right off the bat, that if you're coming to a traditional bank, right here, number one, and it's not just Bankwell, but almost any community, we're a small community bank. Um, people sometimes think that if I go to the small community bank, that's the place where I should go if I'm starting a brand new business. And unfortunately, nine times out of 10, it's not the place to go. Um, <laughs> banks loan out depositors money. People always ask me why. And the answer is a bank isn't really designed to fund startups. A, a, we're lending money that's given to us by depositors. So, you know, in the old, you know, people are coming in, mothers, fathers, grandmothers, sisters, uncles, and they're putting their money in the bank and they, they put it there for a reason because they want it to be safe and secure. And the charter of a bank is to maintain that security for its, for its depositors, not its investors, but its depositors. So we don't invest that money speculatively. Um, we are very controlled, very deliberate, and we have guidelines that we have to follow for how community banks and banks lend money. So we are lenders, and we traditionally will look back at 
your two year, three year history. So when you come to a bank and ask for a loan, typically we're gonna be looking for you to have two years in business. And that means two years of your tax returns for the borrowing entity. The, the joke is that as bankers, we look back at proof and investors and angel investors and family and friends and people who invest in new businesses, they look forward with hope. So that's the difference. A bank is gonna say, show me what you've done. And that typically requires you to come to us with two years worth of tax returns for the business that you're looking to, to borrow. That will be the borrower. And we wanna make sure that over those two years, you, you're able to show us that you have the ability through your revenues and your expenses and your running of your business to pay back the payment on a monthly basis that you've come and asked us for. So we look for your business to be able to service the debt and it has to be reasonable. And then we do look at going forward, what are your projections for the next 12 to 24 months? But those projections aren't quite as important as what has happened. And of course, COVID and, and certain things, the 2008 financial crisis, will, we will understand uh, a down year. But typically we're looking for proof and our regulators and, and the state auditors, they require that we make loans that are repayable. We can't saddle a borrower with a debt that they can't repay from a demonstrated history of being able to do that. So I say it's gotta be two years and I say that that's the rule for most banks and it is, but right under the traditional bank um, in, in this slide is, is the SBA loans. And what SBA is, is it's an insurance policy. The Small Business Administration insures a bank in the event that there's a default and I'm being very simplistic with this, but essentially it gives the bank a little more comfort in making a loan to somebody or a business that doesn't quite meet the high bar of traditional banking. Maybe you don't cover your debt at 1.25%. That's kind of the standard industry requirement for covering debt. SBA allows you to come in at 1% coverage. So it's a little easier to get there and the bank can accept the risk because it's insured and backstopped by the SBA. Doesn't mean you can come in brand new, but if you've got 18 months in the business or a year, one full tax return, I would look at that with an SBA backstop. I wouldn't look at it without an SBA backstop, but I would with the SBA. So it makes it a little bit easier. And there's a couple of different types of, of SBA loans. Some are better for circum certain circumstances, whether you need it for short-term borrowing, uh, seasonal, you know, if you're a landscaper and you're gonna have a big spring, but the winter months are lean and you need some seasonal cash, there's certain programs for that. Or if you're buying a building, the 504 program, you know, and these, these are loans that can go from $200,000 on up to 5 million. So they span a, a wide range, uh, but that's typically where SBA comes in to the picture as it allows the bank to uh, be a little more lenient, a little more generous in the underwriting guidelines. But it is not the land of startups. And I, and I would say that, I don't know what our mix of people in the audience is, but one of the, one of the hardest things in my job and, and is, is explaining to people, when I say hard, I mean, it's somewhat heartbreaking is too, too strong a term, but disheartening maybe. Um, you want to help everybody. That's the nature of a small business lender and a Jessica, Christine. We want to help everybody. Everybody's got a good story, but ultimately we're, we're lending depositors money. And I have to tell the story as to why I, I can't fund your dream. Um, and that's the land of friends and family, home equity lines, borrowing from your 401k program, maybe talking with Jessica or some, or Christine about some micro loans and, and, startups, some state funding, some programs that are out there. There's a lot out there, but um, your traditional bank is probably gonna be looking for you to have at a bare minimum, one year, one complete year of tax return uh, to go on. So um, I'll, I'll leave some time for questions at the end to follow up. And uh, that's my pitch for the evening. Well, Jessica? thank you very much. Jessica, let's hear from you now. 
Great, thank you all so much. Um, so I'm gonna take us in a uh, related but somewhat tangential direction because uh, I represent a slightly varied entity in that of the state of Connecticut. And so um, I'm gonna so let's see if I can get good enough here to share my screen. How, how are we doing here? Can you see, it should say, what is CT next now? Great. Um, so I just figured given the nature of this conversation, CT Next may be a uh, organization title that's not as familiar to all people on the call today. Um, essentially what we are is we are a quasi state entity that is funded entirely and backed entirely by the state of Connecticut. Um, and our mission is really to accelerate the growth of early businesses by offering different elements of resources to them to get them to where they wanna be as fast as possible. Um, so we're really looking to scale growth and ultimately we want the economic impact to create jobs as well to go with that. So what we do in our effort to get there is we uh, approach things a little bit differently than many, many traditional state operated initiatives that drive and support small businesses. We have a little bit of a hybrid in which we will offer some funding support direct to companies. And then we will also support a number of initiatives that may then be made available to the small business or to the startup at either a free or reduced cost to you. And so it's, it's a sort of two headed animal, but both of them are ultimately designed to you know, keep moving things forward. Um, and so what we do here, let me see, this is just to kind of give a little bit of a level set. Essentially, we deploy dollars out to, uh, as I said, sort of those two different mediums there. And we look for return on our investment, which doesn't come typically in the form of money, it comes in leveraged dollars. So for every dollar that we spend from the state, a private entity, or a uh, return on the investment that we make to a company would bring additional dollars in the state and we would refer to that as leverage dollars. We do a lot in the way of mentorship. So that's not gonna be a service that is a um, money maker for the company, but there's a lot to learn. And Christine would probably, um, you know, sort of be top of the list there to, to call on to do those kinds of things. We have a lot of different resources in the state where perspective is important, especially when you're getting going. Um, we support you know, tens of thousands of jobs every year um, in doing this work. And essentially for every $2,000 or thereabouts that we're spending through CT Next to help support small businesses, we're supporting a job, which is you know, pretty, pretty good return considering we don't see any dollars come back our way. So this is just a, a list of sort of the programs and offerings that we have at CT Next. I won't go through them because it's like drinking from a firing <laughs> fire, fire hose. But um, what I did want to sort of mention is I know, Christine, you did a great job level setting in Mike talking about the differences between equity and debt. And there's sort of a third option, which I think most VCs would really recommend you go the route of, if at all possible. And you'll hear it referred to as non-dilutive uh, money. And that's usually going to be something that's referred to as a grant. So a grant is, in my world especially, the dominant source of early funding that you should try to get your arms wrapped around, if at all possible, because they're not taking any kind of ownership stake in the business. So equity is not something that we ask for as part of you receiving that grant. Uh, and in addition to that, there's not an obligation to return the money like a loan would have attached to it. That doesn't mean that it's an you know, open-ended well. Um, obviously, at the state of Connecticut, you'll see our direct-to-company grants and the things that I've spiked out here that are grants. There are criteria and there's eligibility. We want to be risky, meaning that we would happily look to deploy these dollars and um, award these grants to early businesses. But we are the state of Connecticut, which means our return on investment kind of comes in the form of data and growth. We want to back the winner, so to speak, and we want to make sure that by the time you're looking for investment, you're as stacked and ready on the fundamentals as we can possibly help you get to be so that you do really look like a strong candidate when you are uh, moved along the pipeline to our parent organization in a lot of cases, which is Connecticut Innovations. And that may be an entity that more on the line are more familiar with. Um, Connecticut Innovations is the leading uh, early investor here in the region. And we have a team that kind of comes from all different corners of investing. 
We do a lot on the uh, tech side of things. That's clean tech, biotech, um, as well as a lot of sort of we would refer to it as general tech because innovation is taking on a lot of different shapes and forms these days. Um, but you can see as I kind of have the list up here, there are a lot of early stage grant programs that are somewhere in the neighborhood typically of $10,000 to $25,000 to companies where there are conditions on them. We have milestones we want you to achieve in most cases, but barring anything completely impossible to achieve, uh, we do and, and my team tries to kind of make sure that we can help you put those dollars to work as effectively as possible. Our ecosystem development grants are not actually direct to company. Those in conjunction with company development resources are going to more often than not be an instance in which perhaps we fund the running or operation of an accelerator program and they therefore are able to make their resources available to you, the small business, um, again, at a reduced or in some cases free cost. Um, and then what a lot of people look to do in talking the world of investments is eventually many, many, many companies go the route of looking for an investor. Um, it is definitely something that we are really fortunate to have an in-house partner in, and that is our parent organization, Connecticut Innovations. And they themselves even have four main streams in which we would look to do that. So equity financing being the sort of top of the heap, right? Your basic equity structure, XYZ valuation for ABC percentage of the business. Here are our terms that we agreed to. Uh, venture debt is also something that we do, and that's not always known where um, there is a debt component within our house that is available. Um, I believe we go all the way up to, in some cases, up to 2 million in that case. And then we have a number of really cool things that are a little bit more niche, but really interesting. So angel investors are, as Mike said, the family and friends realm is often referred to in conjunction with those angel investors. Um, those could be high net worth individuals. Those could be small family offices. And we have an angel investor tax credit that we manage on behalf of the state. So the nice thing there is it's that it's an incentivizing program. So you as the small business have something to go to market to your angel investors or potential investors and let them know that by investing in your accredited Connecticut business, uh, you're actually eligible or they rather are eligible for a break in the, a credit in their sales tax, state income tax later on in the year. So it's a really interesting um, sort of roundabout way that the state of Connecticut in particular has continued to think about investment strategies and the way that we are uh, presenting value, not just as the high net worth individual, but also from the perspective of the small business that has something of value. It just doesn't have a number attached to it just yet. Um, and then the last thing, and it's funny, I had this slide on here and then, you know, Christine, you sort of touched a little bit on it in referencing the slide deck. A lot of people ask us, what are you looking for when you're looking to invest in a company? What the heck do you want? Um, and not to worry, I've taken this from our CI colleagues and already made fun of them for the non-chronological order in which we've repeated the number five. Um, but, uh, you know, this is really, it's not in any particular order, which is why they get a pass. But fundamentally, the, the backbone of all of it is going to be the team, especially with the investment strategy that a lot of us at the state are looking at things. I think you said it exactly right, Christine. It is a marriage of sorts. And we want to make sure that if we're getting into this for better or for worse, the personality and the leadership that is behind it is somebody of like-mindedness or complementary mindedness to the direction we as investors believe the business can head in. Um, and so, yes, we want to hear about the technology itself. And, and we often see that there are very tech-driven uh, people at the forefront at the end of the day, this isn't an invention when you get to this point. This is an investable business. And so there has to be a business model to go with it that has a return on the investment that you're asking an investor to make in the company. Uh, we really want to know that there's something unique to it. And so the competitive landscape is always of interest. Um, I, I would venture to guess that none of these sort of topics here are new to anybody, but it is always a good reminder. But the bottom line is that you could have the next coming of technology at your fingertips. If it is a challenging dynamic from a leadership position, um, those that are at times referred to as uncoachable, it is a really, really tough nut to crack from the investor side of things. And so the mindfulness that the leadership team um, is sort of the vast majority of what contributes to the decision-making on whether or not to invest is something to always keep in your mind.
Um, and then the last slide is really just my contact information there. Uh, so it may be just a good place to stop, um, only to say that uh, it is pretty unique that a state entity has this sort of continuum of service. Not always does the stuff that's coming from CT Next or sourced through CT Next end up in front of CI. Um, sometimes it sort of happens in reverse where companies that are already invested in through the portfolio of Connecticut Innovations uh, have a reason to take advantage of some of our programming. So um, we're also too little squares inside of a much larger puzzle. So the small business development centers, um, our colleagues at the Department of Economic and Community Development, there's a lot that happens at the state level to support small businesses. This just ends up being a really good initial touch point. And although it's my email up here, um, to go on ctnext.com, there's a chat, there's a real person that answers those questions. So if our stuff isn't quite right for your inquiry, we don't just sort of let you hit the wall. We try to make sure that we can farm it out to the right resource to, again, continue that acceleration of growth. Um, so it's definitely network driven as much as anything else. Um, but we're really excited to kind of see what else is out there. And we've had some really cool successes here in the state as a result of this kind of process and sourcing. Thank you very much, Jessica. That was an awesome overview. I have to agree that this is a very unusual set of programs that her, um, her organization offers. I spent most of my professional career in California and it was not such a warm and friendly startup environment, which you, you wouldn't expect. So I, um, I was very impressed and continue to be impressed by all of the work that, that you're doing. Thank you, yeah. We're lucky. And the fact that our state backs it in that rallying cry to support small businesses is not to be overlooked. I get to be the catalyst for the work, uh, but it is, um, I would concur, pretty, pretty unique in a lot of regards. Right. So for the audience out there, this is a chance to open up the Q&A tab and I can ask questions um, of, of anybody that's here tonight. Um, I think I'm going to get started though, and and for Michael and Jessica, like when is the right time for somebody to approach you, and what's the best way? Michael, maybe you start, and, and Jessica can finish. Uh, it's never too early, and as Jessica mentioned, if if you come to the bank and you don't have that history that we're looking for, again, the you know, Jessica made an interesting. Um, comment and when they look at newer businesses how important the management team is because remember they're looking forward and saying can this group of people take this great technology and bring it to the market and make a profit as a bank i'm saying wow they've already done it so again i look at the proof they look at the hope um so it's never too early because if you're not in the position to get bank financing then i'm going to counsel you to go and talk to jessica or christine go to score, look up the SBA, get that business plan. You, you need it. You, you're not in a position to get this cheap, beautiful bank financing yet. You're going to have to go back to some angel investors or some, some grant money to get going. So I'd say never too soon. Yeah, I, I would, I would echo that. Absolutely. Um, typically when we're talking about programming that, that comes from our office or grants that come, um, you know, we want the company to be more mature than simply an idea. Uh, we don't necessarily at the CT next end of the spectrum need a full on investor deck, but you should have something prepared. Um, we definitely want to ensure that it, anybody looking for funding has done their homework. Um, you know, if I can pop something up on a Google search that is pretty quickly contradictory to something on a slide, it's off putting, right? So we want to make sure that you're prepared. Um, but you know, there is a lot of, if what's the, you know, the first million is the hardest, right? Uh, I don't think that that is in any way untrue as we're talking about investing in your business. That first set of dollars in the door is really the hardest. And um, there isn't one sort of straight path that every company follows. So I would just say that it's never too early, but resources like we have, and, and Mike, you mentioned SCORE, um, they're a phenomenal organization that has regional offices all over the state to help with things like building your business plan in particular, which although I know a lot of investors have moved away from a business plan and now tend to look more at a deck instead, the exercise of doing it is really, really important. Knowing 
what your market looks like, understanding who um, is going to buy your product and those kinds of things that you would get out of doing a business plan is really, really vital. So um, some of our programs may require a minimum of how you know, the age of the business and that kind of thing, that's getting a little too in the weeds. Um, but fundamentally, come to us as early as having something pretty formulated with a little structure around it. I find often that individuals that are looking to get into this realm don't know what they don't know. And uh, I would kind of put myself in that bucket often, frankly, because there's so much that changes and, and introductions to be made. So um, keep asking the questions regardless of how early you are. The worst that happens is we play a little hot potato until we find the right place for you, um, but always keep asking the questions. That's great. I have a question for Jessica. What are the criteria for a good management team in a startup? So there's a balance and some of that is going to be really industry specific. Um, you know, you do definitely need when you're talking about management, somebody that can be open to criticism and critique. Um, there is a lot that you really do know, but in bringing on an, an investment team and a board of directors and those kinds of things, you're going to hear a lot of opinions and they're not always going to be the exact same as yours. Um, so an open-mindedness, and I, I reference coachability, we see a lot of that as the term because a lot of what we're doing on the really early side is coaching because you're coaching them to pitch, right? Um, when you get to that of investability, there has to be a strong drive to make business gear decisions that are um, not without a, an understanding of the fact that others that you now have a common state, stated interest with um, may also have an opinion that's pretty strong as well. Um, going the route of investors changes everything because it goes from being all your choice to others really getting to have a voice in, in making that opinion. And so that, that can definitely be a change. Um, I will just say without being too long-winded in my answer that a lot of what happens is um, you'll hear like uh, remarks that come about the, the sort of founder structure. Um, we see a lot of one or the other. There is oftentimes somebody that is very business centric and understands how the potential of something, but perhaps doesn't know the, the technical component that goes along with their innovation. Um, having that, that there as part of your senior leadership is helpful as is the inverse. So if you are somebody that is a phenomenal researcher that just struck gold and, and came up with something. Um, it is really hard to pivot that from a research-driven technology into something that has a business structure that you can monetize. So um, really making sure that there's a yin to the yang at times is really helpful as well. That's great. Um, here's a question for Michael. Our company has strong cash flow, but no tangible assets for a large loan. We have lots of inventory, but that's not something banks will typically loan on. Is that right? Is this a hopeless situation to get a loan for growth to higher resources and technology? Uh, no, we, we can lend against cash flow and we can certainly take inventory as collateral. I'm surprised to hear that um, you've you've had you've heard that inventory can't be taken as collateral, although I'm not sure what the inventory is. Um, liquor, for instance, can't be taken as collateral. Um, but for the most part, your inventory would count. We do what's called a UCC filing against that. Um, and certainly CNI or commercial industrial lending is a cash flow business and cash flow is what pays loans. So that's very important, sometimes more important than, than, uh, than collateral because collateral doesn't pay us unless we have to come and get it. And we don't want to do that. We want your cash flow. That's great. Um, here's a question for Jessica. Can you give an overview of how your organization works with a company to help get equity investors? Does your organization have a pool of equity investors? Is the state of Connecticut one of the equity investors? So the general model is, um, again, CT Next, we're very network driven. So a lot of what we do are networking functions in which somebody that would be considered that of an angel investor or um, representatives from those small family offices that I referenced early on um, that are typically those, those first in style investors. Um, they're the ones that we would put in front of you as an introduction to meet in, in various formats. Um, is there ever any guarantee that they are the ones that are in the room? No, but networking is, is full of um, 
uncertain guarantees in that regard. Uh, we do have a number of programs that we run like our mentor network where our mentor bench, uh, companies that participate there are actually paired one-on-one -on -one with, a, with a mentor, the dominant ratio of which are themselves investors. Um, so there's a lot of those types of introductions. There is never any guarantee with even a, a meeting with investors, as I'm sure everybody does know. Um, but in terms of the structure that works with Connecticut Innovations, they are typically the lead investor, but you'll see that referred to as a round. Um, there are various rounds. We do a lot of stuff that's pre-seed, which is typically structured as a convertible note. So there's agreed upon terms that eventually convert into equity um, as part of a later on round. And then uh, dominant will be things that you'll see referred to as sort of a, a series A, series B, those kinds of things. Um, but those are gonna be a little bit later stage and those are typically gonna be instances in which at that juncture, you've, you've got a little bit of that network already cruising. Um, so typically we do not invest at Connecticut Innovations alone, um, but I will say that we are known as an entity as being a very risky investor. So unlike what will happen when you get a little further down the line where they wanna see a lot of proof already in the pudding, um, there is an understanding that part of our role in this ecosystem of investing is to take the risk. And that's why you would see us as sort of the lead investor with other co-investors certainly, um, but, but very early on typically in the life cycle of a business. That's great, super helpful. Um, here's a question for both of you. Are there some programs in Connecticut to financially support startups by women and people of color? I, I, I'm happy to, to kick off, Mike, unless you want to. Uh, go ahead, because you're gonna have more options than I am. <laughs> yeah, so um, the short answer is absolutely yes. Um, the condition within that is that we can always do more. Um, and I know that that's definitely been a point of interest at the state level in recent months because we do need to do more. So we have a number of different accelerator programs that we've funded at CT Next in particular, where um, we have a, a black business accelerator that just launched in the Fairfield County area very recently. Uh, we have a women-owned co-working space. A few years back, we actually funded an accelerator program that was targeting businesses that had female leadership, um, but the specialized focus was females returning to the workforce. Uh, maybe they were those that had taken, you know, the better part of a decade off raising children, and now what do you do that you haven't been sitting in an office for 10 years? Um, so we've got a really interesting suite of things that are happening, but they always change. Um, and that's kind of interesting. Organizations like those co-working spaces and accelerator programs in particular, um, our goal is to be there to help them get off the ground, to help them even scale so that more people know they exist to take advantage of those types of initiatives. Um, they sometimes grow out or graduate from the, from the need for us to fund them, but it doesn't mean they go away. Um, the other thing that I will say is that we have the, um, we actually ourselves, CT Next, have a grant from the federal government that is designed specifically to do outreach in those communities in general. Um, so not always is it that a service will be specialized, but um, outreach and education is really unique community and population by population. And so we have a grant to ensure that we're doing everything we can to reach out specifically to those target audiences to make sure that the awareness is there to be successful in winning not just state grants, but federal grants as well. And that's actually, truth be told, where some big money can be. Um, there's a lot there and it's a very sort of big jumping off the cliff. So again, I won't, I won't go too far into detail. Um, but that's sort of when it, it's right for you. Um, and then, you know, a lot of what we do with some of the new initiatives that we're funding is given the fact that we are aware that women led and minority led businesses are statistically finding it harder for those early investors. A number of the resources that we have available, we try to remove some of the barriers to entry on. Um, so occasionally there is a very minimal fee to take on some one on one consulting work. Um, in certain instances, we will waive those fees and those kinds of things because every penny counts. So there's a lot there. Um, 
and we can certainly talk into more detail, but globally, there are a number of moving parts under that umbrella um, with intent and purpose to service those communities. And on the on the lending side from, from the bank, um, again, because we require that that track record and that history, it's not so much on the startup side, but the SBA does have specific programs that target uh, women owned, minority owned and veteran owned businesses that again will give us that backstop to, to allow a little more leniency in our underwriting guidelines and maybe get you into a bank loan. Um, again, the money comes from the bank on an SBA insured loan. The SBA is providing insurance, but the lender is providing the money. So it's still the depositor's money, but it's backstopped. And I will mention one other thing, uh, it's, 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 it's alphabet soup, it's a CRA and that's the Community Reinvestment Act. And it's a little bit of a tip for you. If you're, if you're opening a business or you have a business um, in a specific area, community banks and banks are all required to reinvest in the communities that they serve. So where we have our bank branches and what we call our footprint, we are mandated to put dollars back into those communities. It's a strong mandate and it's a requirement. So we, you know, I will look to do a loan in Fairfield County and be much more aggressive on it than I would a loan in New London County where I have no branches. So if you're a business in New London or you're a business in Middlesex or you're in Hartford, it pays to shop local uh, because that bank has to get some dollars into that community. And I'm going to work hard to get dollars into my footprint, much more aggressive on rate, much more aggressive on terms and conditions and maybe seeing 18 months versus needing two years in Bridgeport than I am in Hartford or any, anywhere else in my footprint. So remember that as you're out looking at, at banks. Thank you, both of you. I want to echo what Michael just said, how important it is to have a good relationship with your banker as you are starting your business journey. I think one of the things that we all realized during COVID is how important it really was to have somebody to call when things um, you know, started to change and when um, you know, when the Paycheck Protection Plan came out and you had to apply through a bank. Mm -hmm. It was mm -hmm. huge be able to have a person at the other end of the, the phone to, to speak to. So a huge advocate for that. Well, thank you. I think we're pretty much through our questions. So at this point, I'm going to turn it back over to Kayla, who is going to, um, who's going to introduce our two brave souls who are going to do their elevator pitch for the group. Thank you, Michael, Jessica, Christine. Um, this will be our interactive part. Um, thank you to everyone who answered the survey last week and kind of let us know what you were more interested in, those small discussion groups or the elevator pitches. We have two special audience members. Um, we have Wendy Ward, who's representing Futures Thrive, and Tim Van Hooser, whose business is called Into the Best. So I'm going to go ahead and um, Tim and Wendy, I'm going to make you guys panelists right now so that we can see you and hear you. So just give me one second. Wendy, I just promoted you to a panelist. You should be getting that little notification. And Tim, it's coming your way. So this should just be pretty instant. Yay, I think it's working. So let's just wait till Tim gets on um, and then we can get started. Just one more second. I see that there's two Tims on. I don't know if he's on two devices. So I'll promote both of your devices, Tim, to be a panelist. Let's see. Hmm. Let's give it, let's give him one more second because he went away as an attendee. And it looks like it might be working. Tim, can, if you can hear me, go ahead and turn on your camera and microphone so that we can see you. Here he is, excellent. All right, so um, I think we'll just let you guys go for it. Um, we'll turn off our cameras, um, Christine, Michael, Laura, and Wendy, if you wanna have the floor first, I know you volunteered first via email. Um, you can go ahead with your one minute elevator pitch. Thank you so much for being a volunteer. Thank you. Hi, I'm Wendy Ward. I'm, I founded Futures Thrive to change the trajectory of mental health for our children and families. As you likely well know, even before COVID, our children were suffering from stress and anxiety at unsustainable levels. 
My team has developed a groundbreaking early intervention mental health screener for youth. It's as easy and routine as the eye chart. Our tool uses game-based technology backed with artificial intelligence to affordably meet the rising and acute needs of children, doctors, educators, and families. Thank you so much. Um, I think we'll hold our feedback. We'll let Timothy go and then you know we'll give you both feedback at the same time, but thank you so much. Go ahead, Tim. Go ahead and unmute yourself, Tim. Can you hear me now? Excellent. Yep, go for it. Great, thank you. Do you know what the difference between the Titanic and the state of Texas was a few weeks ago? At least the lights were on when the Titanic sank. My name is Tim Van Hooser, and I'm the CEO of Into the Best. Into the Best performs strategy and technology consulting for corporate executives to help them grow and enhance their companies. I'm here tonight to get input on how to start a hedge fund to capitalize on an idea I developed after trading electricity in PJM ISO New England and the New York ISO. By predicting relative prices, I was able to save a company 20% on their wholesale sale power purchases made in the day ahead or real-time markets, which resulted in savings of $350,000 a month on 1.75 million invested. I would like to start a proprietary trading company to make money in ways that are not correlated to major market indices. Thank you very much for your time and the informative presentations. Yay, if all of our other panelists want to turn back on their cameras and microphones. Thank you so much, Tim. You're welcome, thank you. Hey, great job. Thank you. So Christine, Jessica, Mike, do you each want to just kind of weigh in? Um, we're not putting these, you know, we, we thought we were going to do a friendly competition if like five or 10 people um, volunteered, but since it's just two and they have great ideas, I'd, I'd love to hear what you guys thought of it. Uh, Tim's idea is probably way over my head. <laughs> you know, I, uh, I'd have to really flesh that out and understand um, how you're going to make money. You know, if you're in a, you're in a very specific, um, and technical business where you're going to, you're going to trade essentially um, something you're going to get it for less and trade it for more. Hopefully um, I'd like to hear a little bit more about, you know, the nuts and bolts of how that goes, uh, Jessica. And Wendy, I thought your, your presentation was, it was timely, you know, so certainly very interesting to all of us who have kids um, and have watched them go through this COVID uh, experience. So um, kind of easy to understand. And it, I'd be anxious to see that technology. Uh, I'm happy to go next. Um, Tip, I think first of all, you both did a really nice job. A minute is it's hard. A minute's hard. <laughs> a minute is fast. Um, I full confession, Wendy actually Futures Thrive is a company that's utilizing some of our consulting services for federal grant programs through CTNEX. So it's nice to see you. <laughs> Unintentional plug. <Thank> you. <laughs> I know with good news to boot. Oh my gosh, you're, you're very, very welcome. Um, you know, you're, you're sort of a real life example, very truthfully. So of some of it really being put to good use and being very coachable. So um, great job on the one minute pitch. I think, uh, you know, it was really straight to the point and I completely followed you from beginning to end. And, and it was applicable, obviously, given where we're at right now, but in the grand scheme of things. And, and so it was really digestible. Um, Tim, I think you did a really nice job. I would concur with Mike. There's a lot within the work that you're doing that it's really specialized. And that's a hard thing to squeeze into a one minute pitch when there's a very industry specific proficiency that is um, necessary because a lot of the work that you're gonna be doing is really, really targeted and uh, very niche in its, in its own um, implementation. So um, I think you did a really nice job humanizing yourself, right? Starting with um, the Titanic component and that kind of thing is really nice because everybody gets really kind of rigid and, and tight to start. Um, so loosening the vibe is kind of a, a good way to start. Um, and then jumping right into it, it's clear you know what you're talking about and that that is hammered home within your within your minute delivery there. So I would concur with Mike. I'm excited to sort of see how that would model. And I imagine very specifically so that with more time, you'd kind of get there. A minute's, a minute's hard, man. So, but you, you guys just did such a great job. I'm very, very impressed. 
Yeah, I don't know that I have anything to add to that. I think a minute is a challenge, um, but I think I understand perfectly what each of your businesses are. Um, and Tim, I agree the the Titanic thing definitely gets people's attention. And I think the hedge fund concept needs a bridge like that, because if you were to lead in with anything else, it, it, it's, it's just not so relatable. I think the only thing that I might add to, to your pitch is um, a little bit more, you know, half a sentence, a sentence about why you're the right person for this. Um, but other than that, I thought it was great. And Wendy, yeah, you, I think you nailed it. Uh, start to finish, I understood exactly what you're trying to do. And uh, like Mike, I think we all would like to see this problem solved. So thank you. Uh, can I just add, I applaud the two of you for signing up to do this. You, This is was a sort of like dice roll of who's gonna be on the line and, and everything else. So the fact that you're both willing to throw yourself to the uh, anonymous wolves is a true credit um, and not always something that everybody feels the most comfortable doing. So to start even there, well, well, well done. Um, that's definitely a very challenging step one. And you both did a great job even just raising your hand to participate is awesome. Uh, so, uh, you know, clearly there's no winner because you were both great. So I'm going <laughs> to get your email addresses from Kayla at the library and I'm going to send both of you a uh, $50 gift certificate. Uh, it's a new e-gift card program. It'll uh, come right to your phone and you'll be able to use it uh, I'll send you a link and you'll be able to see the participating businesses. We got about 40 and so you can shop local and, and uh, treat yourself after all the hard work you guys have been doing to start your businesses. So, and we're so lucky to have all these innovators and entrepreneurs here in New Canaan. So thank you. Thanks, Laura. Thanks, Wendy. Thanks, Tim and Christine and Jessica and Michael. Um, I just wanted to, I guess we're closing out the series right now, which is kind of crazy since we did a lot of planning for this. And we were, you know, hopefully a lot of you uh, stuck with us all four weeks and took, took away some things that, you know, you can apply to your business and your life. Um, I want to especially thank Christine for being um, kind of like our MC every single time and finding great, you know, local talent and people who she thought would be you know, good at presenting and good at giving advice. And I'd like to thank Laura for helping you know, put this all together with the library. And um, we'll be sending out, I'd like to send out a, like a kind of like a follow-up email, sort of just synthesizing everyone's contact information who you, know, you might've heard from, all of those YouTube video recordings so that you can refer back to a talk. And if you have any further questions, just, just get in touch with the library or with the chamber. Thanks everyone.